I don't think I was recording, so I'll have to recap um, 18 and 19 at the end. So for this one, we put, what was that? <laughs> we put x minus the first x value, it crosses, so we have a one, x minus the second x value, with it crosses, so we use a one, x minus the third x-intercept, and then it also crosses through that one, so we used a one. Then we use this point, we plug in the y value for y, and we plug in that same x value for all the x's, right? x is zero. Then I did the computation. So this was two times negative four times negative six, and it turned out to be a positive 48. But if I wanna get a by itself, I had to divide both sides by 48, so then I ended up with A equal to 24 over 48, which did reduce to one half, okay? So remember, we said this is almost our answer. We just needed to know what A was, and then we needed to clean it up. So A is one half, and instead of writing a negative, you just write X plus two, and you never have to write one exponent ever. So notice I don't have the ones here anymore. So number 21 has the same exact directions. It says find a polynomial with least possible degree having the graph shown. And this graph looks different from the previous graph, right? So we still have that same template. So on your note sheet, I would put, if you see this phrase, find a polynomial function, and you're given a graph, this is what you need to do this problem, okay? You might need to know this information about your multiplicities as well, okay? So these two pieces of information are for finding a polynomial function. Now, if I use that information to practice another, another answer, because we don't know which one we're gonna get, and I promise you the one in the final is not gonna be the same exactly like either of these. It'll be just a tiny bit different. Um, but here, if I write my template, it's y equals some coefficient that I'll figure out later, and then x minus the first x-intercept, which is negative five, and it does cross through there, so that's why there's an exponent of one, and then x minus the second x value, but this one doesn't cross. This one just bounces right off of it, right? And in that case, we're supposed to use um, m as two. Once you have that template, you don't have to clean it up yet. You could just leave it alone, but you do wanna start plugging in the coordinates of your point. So here I have x, here I have y. I plugged in nine for y and I plugged in zero for all the x's. And then if I had zero and a double negative, that's actually plus five, right? And then zero minus three, but I do have to square it. So remember our orders of operations, right? Our orders of operations tell us that we have to do what's in the parentheses first. Then we have to apply our exponents. So this negative three times another negative three is a positive nine. And then finally I can multiply and divide, right? So here I multiplied those two together and that's where this 45 came from. I didn't do all this. I literally just typed this in my calculator and it gave me 45. I just knew that A was multiplied by that. So when I rewrote it, I wrote A multiplied by 45 but I need to get A completely by itself. So we divide by 45 on both sides. It'll go away on the right side. And on the left hand side, I get nine over 45, which when I typed it in my calculator, it actually reduced it to one over five. So now that I have my A value, this is the equation that they were asking me about. Um, and I plugged in one, five, one over five for A, 
I did go ahead and get rid of the double negatives to turn to a plus. I do not have the one. And here, I had to keep it exactly as it was. You do have to write squares and cubes. You just don't ever have to write powers of one. So for 22, it says, give the equations of any vertical, horizontal, or oblique asymptotes for the graph of the rational function. This is the rational function that they gave me. And I kind of needed to talk about um, what we're doing, right? When you're trying to find your vertical asymptote, you're taking your denominator and you're equaling it to zero. In this problem, my denominator was x minus one. So I set that to zero, I added one on both sides and I got the value x equal to one, right? For horizontal asymptotes, we have to look at, at the um, degrees, the degree highest exponent of x in the numerator and highest exponent of x in the denominator. For this problem, because the numerator did not have any x's at all. That is why three is zero, because it's just completely missing x's, right? There's no exponent on x, so that's why we have zero. But for the degree of the denominator, we do have an x, and his exponent is an invisible one, right? So that's why the degree of the denominator is one. Then you compare these two values together. So you try to see, is the numerator bigger? smaller or equal to the degree of the denominator. In this case, have zero for the numerator and one for the denominator, and zero is less than one, right? So that means that my degree of my numerator is less than the degree of the denominator. When you have this situation happening, the horizontal asymptote is automatically at y equals zero. There's nothing to compute, nothing to do. You just determined the numerator's exponent is smaller than the denominator's exponent. So this is automatically horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator, okay, then that means there is no horizontal asymptote. There's only one other case that I haven't talked about yet, and that's when they are equal to one another. And we will actually have another problem uh, in a second that will cover that case. What do we do when the degrees are actually the same, right? What if there was an X in the numerator and you had an X at the bottom? So both have degree of one, what's the horizontal asymptote then, right? So I'll cover that in the next example. So 23 has the same directions give the equations of any vertical, horizontal, or oblique asymptotes. We don't ever have oblique, so that will never be your answer. But look at this. It's x squared minus 3x minus 4. And at the bottom, you have 2x squared minus x minus 10. So for the vertical asymptote, I'm doing the exact same process. I'm taking my denominator and equaling it to zero. But in this case, my denominator was actually a quadratic, right? So when I took that quadratic equal to zero, I had to use my quadratic formula to figure out what those answers were gonna be. So I did go ahead and B is negative one, negative one squared minus four times A, which is two times C, which is a negative 10 all over two times a. And then I just simplified this, right? So the negative and the negative to a positive one, the two times two at the bottom turned into a four at the bottom. And inside the radical, I typed all of that in my calculator. It's basically positive one plus 80, which is 81. And there is a square root of 81. It just happens to be a nice number, nine. So I'm just computing this. So I split it into two pieces. I did one plus nine over four, which was 10 over four. 
And then I did one minus nine over four, which was negative eight over four. And then I used the calculator to simplify both of those. So I got two answers. I got X equals five halves and I got X equals to negative two. Now, when looking for the horizontal asymptote, we had to go back and look at those degrees, right? So the highest exponent of X here is two for the very first term. And the highest exponent at the bottom is also a two exponent from the very first term. So both of them had a high exponent of two, which means that my degrees were actually the same in this case. And when they're the same, this is how you find the horizontal asymptote. You take the leading coefficient of the numerator divided by the leading coefficient of the denominator. So the leading coefficient here, the guy with the degree two, the guy with two exponent has a number in front, but it's an invisible one. And so that's why this coefficient is one. And then the coefficient, the number in front of this x squared is two. So that number that I put down there. So it has to do with the numbers in the front, a one and a two. And you can't simplify that. I mean, one half is one half. It doesn't reduce or anything. So we just get that the horizontal asymptote is at y equals one half. Be careful on the test. Um, I think it happened on the test and it's gonna happen on the final exam is that they'll have the same numbers, but they'll get the letters backwards. So make sure that you remember that vertical asymptotes are x equals and horizontal asymptotes are y equals. So if they start saying that the vertical asymptotes are at y equals five halves and y equals negative two, you know that that one's wrong because it's got the wrong letters, okay? Whenever you have an equation y equals something, that's a horizontal line, not a vertical line. Only x equal to something is a vertical line, okay? So make sure that you're using the correct letters. Now, 24 and 25, we're skipping for now. Um, again, if you have questions about those later, please let me know. I will text you back. I hope you work out through the problem. Um, but they're just not like anything that's on the final. And I'd rather concentrate on what I think you might see on the final, okay? So 26 and 27, I think. You're not gonna get two of these just like the polynomial one, right? They gave us two polynomial graphs and then we had to give them the equation. You're only gonna get one kind of problem. Um, the same with these, even though 26 and 27 have the same directions, they both give us a picture and they both ask us for the function, okay? Um, when you see that, when it, you see find an equation of a rational function, you need to remember this information. And you need to remember that your numerator is going to come from your x-intercepts and your denominator is going to come from your vertical asymptotes. If there happens to be a number in front, that will come from your horizontal asymptote, okay? If your horizontal asymptote is zero, then that means that the numerator's degree was lower, right, than the denominator's degree. If your horizontal asymptote is not at zero, it's at some other number, okay, then that would mean that the degree of the numerator is the same as the degree of the denominator. And that's gonna come in handy because it might be that I have to square something um, just to make them have the correct degrees. Okay, that's just a little bit more complicated part. And if you don't see a horizontal asymptote at all, then that means that the degree of the numerator should have been bigger than the degree of the denominator. Okay. So if you have degree, or no, I'm sorry. If the horizontal asymptote is missing, then the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. 
if the horizontal asymptote is at y equals some number, not zero, but any other number, then that means the degree of your numerator equals the degree of the denominator. Not only that, it means that that number is your coefficient. Of the numerator. Ah, trying to squeeze it in there. Okay. So for my problem, I did not, I only had one x-intercept right here, and it was right in the middle between four and six. So I knew that that was five. So notice in the numerator, I wrote x minus the x-intercept. Remember that from the polynomial section, right? It's always x minus the x-intercept. The same goes for the vertical asymptotes. So there is a vertical asymptote on the y-axis, and the x value there is zero. So that's why I have x minus the zero. The other horizontal asymptote is right here, and that's at six. So when I put it in the denominator, it's gonna be x minus six. Also notice that my, my x-intercept went through, right? Which is why I don't have an exponent here. It's like an exponent of one. For the vertical asymptotes, just leave them alone. We'll figure out if we need exponents or not. So right now you have x times x, which means the bottom has an x squared. It's hidden, but it does have an x squared. And the top only has an exponent of 1. So it would only just be x with a 1 power. Now it tells me that since my horizontal asymptote is here, right? it's trailing off towards 0. My horizontal asymptote is at y equals zero. It means that the degree of the numerator has to be smaller than the degree of the denominator. And right now, it is smaller. Isn't this highest exponent smaller than that highest exponent? So we don't have to do anything to our problem because we have exactly what we need. So all I did was clean up this guy Instead of writing x minus 0, I could have just wrote x. And then since there's no number in front, nothing going on with this x minus 5, I didn't really need to have it in parentheses, OK? And when you see the choices in the test, it's not have the three parentheses like that. It will make it look nicer, OK? So these are little bits of process. So we'll do another one to just kind of um, reiterate everything. So 27 has the exact same directions as 26. They want us to find the equation. So we know already that the numerator comes from the x-intercepts and the denominator comes from the vertical asymptotes. But notice this time I have two x-intercepts, right? I have this one, which is going through there, so it will be a 1. And this one, which is going through there, so it will be a 1. What happens when you do x to the 1 power times x to the 1 power? You end up with x to the 2 power. And down here, there's no powers. It's just x. And when we have just x, we know it has an exponent of 1. Now, the vertical asymptote is here, and it was right in between 0 and 4. So I went ahead and assumed that that was at x equals 2. So the denominator is x minus that 2. I also noticed that there was a horizontal asymptote down here. Again, it's halfway between 0 and negative 4. So I assumed it was negative 2. So I wrote that my horizontal asymptote was at y equals negative 2. And here, I remembered that if it's equal to a number, it means that my degree of my numerator should be the same as the degree of the denominator. Now, the top is a 2, but the bottom's only a 1. So what does that mean? That means I need to change the bottom to match the top. How do you do that? 
you just put a square there. If this had three, I would have to put a cube there so that I could have the same exponents, okay? So in this case, I won't have just x minus two. I'll actually have x minus two squared, okay? Not only that, remember that this number tells you what the leading coefficients are. So negative two can actually be written as a fraction, negative two over one. And so then it's obvious that the leading coefficient of the numerator is gonna be that negative two, and the leading coefficient of the denominator is going to be that one. So there's my leading coefficient. Instead of writing x minus zero, I just wrote x. There's the same x minus four. There's the x minus two, but it's got a square now because they're supposed to have the same b. And there is an invisible one coefficient down there as well. So these are a little bit tricky, but they are doable. They'll just require lots of notes on these guys, okay? And if you have two examples on your note sheet, that might help as well, okay? Just be careful to copy down your examples numbers um, and actually write down what the numbers are for your problem in this final. Okay, I think this was sort of like the last unit that we covered. Oh, um, speaking of the last unit that we covered. I finally have gotten a lot of the grading done. I only have your class to grade and um, the college algebra for pre-cal class to grade. So I'm gonna grade your guys' tests next. Um, I hope to have them finished graded by today, but if not, by tomorrow, the latest. And I will post everything, you know, all the paperwork that I graded. I will post it in the test um, for as a file for you to read. So you can read, you know, all my marks, like, you know, you did this correct, or you didn't do this or whatever. You can see all my feedback. And on that document, I'm also going to be calculating um, like the highest, the lowest grades really that you'll need to get certain letter grades in the class. Okay, so I'll take all your scores. I even, cause you know how I'm gonna replace the final exam. So I do it two ways. I do it like as if I wouldn't have replaced the final exam. And then I do it as if I did replace the final exam. And then whichever number's lower, that's the one I tell you. You just need this <laughs> to get whatever certain grade, okay? It can be a little bit complicated. So um, I'm gonna do it for you guys and then just make sure you read your document because it'll have those numbers on there, okay? If you're missing a letter, like let's say it says, oh, I need a 40 to get a C in the class. I need a 40 on my final to get a C in the class. Or it says, I need an 80, an 89 to get a B in the class. Um, but it doesn't say anything about an A. That's just because the scores that you have right now were not high enough for you to be able to get an A at this point, okay? But our My Math Lab stuff is still open until Friday. So uh, make sure that you're going into your My Math Lab and completing as much as you can in there. Um, getting your, your homework averages as close to 100 as possible so that you can bank all of those points, okay? And the more and more you do in your My Math Lab, the lower that score that you need for on the final exam. It'll just keep decreasing little by little, okay? But I'll give you a, a heads up on what, what you're looking at <laughs> once I uh, pass out those tests. And I'll send an email in Canvas and I'll send a remind message so that way you know to go look, okay? Um, so for number 29, this was these um, interest problems. So it says find the future value and interest earned if, uh, what is that, 8,804 and 56 cents is invested for eight years at 5% compounded in two different ways compounded semi-annually, and then compounded continuously. So for semi-annually, it's got one formula, which is this formula. And this is the same formula that you use for all the situations, whether it says annually, 
in that case, n would equal one semi-annually. I don't think I spelled that right, but it's okay. Um, quarterly. I don't know which one you're going to get on the final, so I'm writing all of them. Um, monthly, which means 12. Um, I think there's weekly, which rarely ever happens, but I have seen it before. And then daily. And your book uses three, six, four. Okay. So if you see any of those words, then you know you have to use this formula. And because you have a specific in value, each one of those um, situations. For continuously though, this word, it has to be this formula, okay? It's the only one that has its own formula, continuously. And then it's just a matter of picking out all the information and plugging it into that formula and getting your calculator, okay? So for A, P is always what you missed or the amount of loan that you took out, right? It's what you're doing that's causing this interest to happen, right? You're either putting it in an account that's earning interest or you're taking out a loan, which is going to have to be owed interest. So that P value, it did say that this was invested, right? So that's why P is this value. Your percentages is always your rate, your R, but you do need to put it in its decimal form. And remember, your calculator does do for you, right? If I type in five and then second parentheses, that gives me that percent symbol and all I'd have to press enter and it'll give me the decimal version of it, okay? So if you forget how to get that decimal version, you can put it in your calculator. Now T is always your time. So that's gonna be the eight years. And then N, because it said semi-annually, that's why N is equal to two. If it had said monthly, the N would be 12 and so forth, right? So I'm just plugging all these numbers in. So P is supposed to be this 8,000 number. That's the number one. R is supposed to be the 0 0.05. N is supposed to be two. N is, shows up again. So two shows up again. And then it's N times T. So I did two times eight. Okay. I put that whole thing exactly like that in my calculator. And as long as it looks exactly like it does on your paper, you should be entering it incorrectly. And when I did that, it gave me this value. Now it did me a different decimal. You do have to round to the nearest cent, okay? So make sure when you try to type this in your card that you round it to the correct cent. Now, I would be done here on the final. This is all they'll ask you for on the final. I just want the future value or the final amount. Um, but this problem is for the future value and the interest. So I need this extra formula. Interest is by taking the amount that you get afterward minus the original amount, right? So this was the total amount that I had afterward. This was the original amount that we put in. And so when you take the subtraction of those two, you ended up, I ended up with this number as the amount of interest earned. Now, similarly, I did the same stuff, right? I identified all the same numbers as before, but for continuously, there's no in. And that's because the formula doesn't even have an in to use, right? So P was this 8,000 number, that's the letter E. And then my rate, which was 0 0.05, times T, which was eight. I put all of that in my calculator exactly the way it is. And remember your E button is right here. You have to press second and then that button and it'll pop it up. So 804.56 E, and then you can type in 0 0.05 times eight. But notice how it looks exactly like it does on my paper, right? The only thing is, is when they put times, they put a little E, and when I write times, I usually use dot. Okay, but other than that, it's exactly the same. And then you're just rounding that to two decimals. But zero is not going to change six. So that's why it stayed this number, 13134.86.
And again, if I want to know the interest, I'm going to take that total amount minus the original amount, and then we get the amount of interest for that problem. Okay. So there's definitely one like this. It's just more like this problem than any of the rest. And be careful because if it says the word continuously, then it would be like this problem. Okay. We don't ask you for the interest on the final. I know that for sure. I just don't remember which one of these two cases it is. Okay, now, um, that was 29. So number 30 on the review was this problem. And this one I wrote down in case <laughs> somebody didn't remember what buttons to push. I would even write what buttons to push in the calculator because this one does heavily rely on our calculator. Unless you're like super awesome at scientific notation, I would recommend using the, the calculator. So it says, find, it says H3O plus, but that's the hydronium ion concentrate uh, symbol. So it says, find the hydronium ion concentrate if the pH is 3.4, and it says, use the formula, pH equals negative log of the hydronium concentrate, and then round your answer to the nearest 10. So the first thing I did was since I know pH is 3.14, I replaced the pH with 3.14. And so I'm trying to solve this equation. Now I can't get rid of the log until I get rid of the sign in front. So I just divided by a negative one coefficient and a negative divided by negative turned to positive and a positive divided by negative turned to negative. Then I had to remember that with log, and there's no number written there, no little subscript. Um, I have to remember that that's called the common log, right? So this one was called the common log and one was called um, the natural log. And you have to remember that this one is log base 10 and this one is log base E, okay? So we gotta remember those two things because in order for me to get rid of a logarithm, I have to use a base that is the same as the base of the logarithm. Now, it's invisible, so I had to remember that when there's no base here, that it's automatically a 10 because it says LOG and not LN. So when I know that, that means I'm going to do 10 raised to this side and 10 raised to all of that side. What happens when you have base 10 and log base 10 is they cancel each other out, right? So all we have on the right-hand side is just that hydronium ion concentrate. Now I did take this and stick it in my calculator and I got this number. And so I do know what the hydronium ion concentrate number is. However, on the final, all the problems are in uh, scientific notation, okay? And so you could do one of two things. You could type in all those answers that they give you in your calculator and see which one gives you what you got. Or you could just convert what you got into scientific notation and then pick the one that matches. OK, so what you do there is completely up to you. I just wanted to make sure that I could enter the answer into my math lab. So I went ahead and put it in scientific notation. So I'm going to start with this number. 10 raised to the negative 3.4 get that same decimal, right? I didn't chop it off at all. I left it exactly the way it was. Then what I do is I press mode and then I go down and then to the right and I hit enter because that's going to highlight the scientific mode. So I pressed enter and then I hit second and then I hit mode again so that I can quit. Now that I'm out of there, I'm gonna hit enter and what it's going to do is it's going to basically copy this, but because I'm in a different mode now, it's going to give me the answer in scientific notation. And so notice I got this 3.981 blah, 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 times 10 to the negative four. And it said round it to the nearest 10. So this eight actually changes that nine to a 10. 
and then that changes the to a four. So it actually ends up becoming 4.0, but still times 10 to the negative four. And this is what you would find in the answer choices, okay? Now, don't forget though, and I wrote it on here because this will happen, but what ha watch what happens when I try to do the next something or another. It gives me my answers in scientific notation. So don't forget to put your calculator back in normal mode. So to do that, you hit mode, then hit the down arrow to highlight normal, and then hit enter, and then second click. And then now you're in the correct mode. So when I do 45 times 25 again, it gives me actual correct number, okay? So there is one like this on the test. So definitely get used to using the calculator. I know it's there, I saw it, I remember this one. <laughs> so make sure you know how to do that with the cap. Or just type in all the answers in, in that they give you and see which one equals what you got. Okay, more exponential stuff. So this one said solve this equation. And that's all it said was just to solve it. Um, so what I did is if I'm gonna get rid of an exponential base two, I have to use a log base two. Remember they're inverses of each other, they undo each other. So if I wanna get rid of an exponent base two, I have to use log base two. So log base two and this base two cancel each other out. And all I end up with is that exponent. Over here, I did the same thing. I did log base two on the left side, and I also did log base two on the right side. You have to do it on both sides, right? And this, you can type in your calculator. You just have to use your change of base formula. The change of base formula we used was to do ln of the argument over ln of the old base. And it's pretty obvious that you've changed the base when you went from log base two to ln's, right? Then I still have to solve for x, so I added two on both sides. I don't know what this number is, so I just wrote plus two next to it. But then I went ahead and typed all of that in the calculator, and I got this decimal. Now, 32 is another exponential equation. It's just not like one of the ones on the test, so I skipped it for now. Um, but number 33 is kind of like one of the ones on the test. So it has 2e to the 2x plus 6 exponent equal to 5. Excuse me. This is what I started with. So the first thing I have to do is I have to get my exponential part by itself before I start doing all the log business. Okay. So I did go ahead and divide by this 2. So I divided by 2 on both sides of my equation. It canceled here, so I had the E thing all by itself, and five divided by two was 2.5. Then I have to remember that I need to use the same log with the same base to get rid of this base. But I wrote a note here. Remember that log base E of something is the same as saying LN of something. So I don't need to write log base E on both sides. What I need to write is LN on both sides. So ln of the left side, ln of the right side. Here, the base e, it's like invisible, but we know it's the same. So this has a base e, and the exponential has a base e, which means they wipe each other out. So all I have left is a 2x plus 6 equal to ln of 0.25. And I still have to solve for x. So I minus the 6 over, and then I got to this. I can't actually subtract it because I don't know what this number is yet. But then I had to get rid of the two, so I divided both sides by two. And then what I did was I typed this whole fraction in my calculator and it gave me negative 2.54. Now we're gonna skip 34 and 35 for now. Um, again, if you need help with those, let me know, and I can help you with the review. They're more exponential or long problems. It's just not like one of the ones on the final. And I'd rather use my class time 
working on problems that are similar to the ones in the final. Um, so 36 is this equation, and they just ask us to solve it. So the first thing, what we want to do is we want to apply this rule that said if you had log base v of one argument equal to log with the same base of another argument, then that would mean that the arguments would have to be equal. In order for this expression to be the exact same as that expression, and they already have the same base, it just means that those arguments would have to be the same, okay? So the problem though, is that I don't have one log equal to one log, right? I have one log equal to two logs. However, we can use our log properties to write them as one, okay? So I'm going to use this log property. So when I have a plus, it actually means we need to multiply those two arguments together, okay? So I do have a plus, so I'm gonna write it just as one log. And since this doesn't have a base or it has the invisible 10 base, I'm leaving it as an invisible 10 base, okay? But I'm taking that argument of five and I'm multiplying it by this argument of x plus four. Now they both have just one log on each side. I can use that one-to-one -one property that says, well, then four x has to be the same as what's in that other argument. I just went ahead and distributed the five, okay? So this four x has to equal this argument then I went ahead and solved for x. So I minus my 5x over, I got negative 1x equal to 20, divided both sides by my negative 1, and I got x equal to negative 20. However, however, this negative 20 makes at least one argument in the original equation negative. And if your answers do that, if it makes it zero or negative, okay, then I'll write that down too. The original equation negative or zero. When those two things happen, then those numbers are not actual solutions. Okay. Since this is the only number I got, and if I were to put it right there, this argument would be negative 80, which cannot happen. This argument is always a positive five, so that one's safe. But here, if I plugged in negative 20, I'd get log of negative 16 which is not doable. It doesn't make any sense. Your calculator will tell you too. You try to do log of 18, oops. I'm sorry, negative 16. It tells you it's an error, okay? So you can't have a negative argument. Since this was the only answer I found and it was no good, then the answer is no solution. I think they'll use no solution on the final, but I noticed in my math lab, it had this as the answer, okay? So they mean the same thing. It means no solution as well. It means there's no answers. Normally you put your little answers in the little braces, right? When it says empty, like there's no answers inside, that's what that symbol means. We still got a ways, but we're getting there. We're getting there. We only have like 30, 20 some minutes. Oh gosh, no, we don't even have 20 minutes. We have 19 minutes. Okay. So this is another one of those problems. And again, I want to use that property that says if I have this equal to this, then I just need to worry about one argument equaling to the other argument, okay? Because I see logs on both sides. So that's a property I want to use. The problem is, is this side has two logs. So I have to use a different property to combine them. So if I minus, then that actually means I'm going to take the one with the positive argument at the top and the one with the negative y, negative, log is going to have the argument at the bottom. 
And so that's exactly what I did, right? This positive log, that argument goes on top. This is a negative log, so that argument went at the bottom. Once I had it as one log equal to one log, then I could drop the logs and only have to worry about those arguments being equivalent. So from here, this is actually one of those fraction equations, right? So we have to multiply everybody by the common denominator. This is the only denominator. So that's my common denominator. I did it on both sides. It cancels on the left, leaving me with just x plus or five plus x. But over here on the right, I actually have to distribute that and I get four x minus eight. From here, I just started solving for x. So I minus x over, I got three x. I added the eight over, I got 13 equal to three x. And then I divided both sides by three. That did not reduce in my calculator. So it just stayed as 13 over three. But this answer makes both of the original, uh, both arguments in the original equation positive, okay? So this argument's always a four, right? But if I plug in 13 over three here minus two, it's a positive number. If I do five plus 13 over three, it's a positive number. So since both of the arguments are positive, then this is a solution. And so then you do put it in the little braces. Thirty-eight and thirty-nine. Again, we're going to skip for to save time. Um, but number forty is a good one because number forty, it's not the same scenario, but they will give you the equation, and they will tell you how many years. Or if the equation says that t is in days, then it'll give you the number of days. If it tells you t is in weeks, it'll give you the number of weeks. Okay. But all you really need is to focus on the equation that they give you and what number they're telling you to plug in, okay? That's all it is. So don't pay attention to this number because this number has nothing to do with the question. It just has to do with where the formula came from. Notice that there's 50, 50 in the formula, right? That's like thrown in there to try to confuse you. Who cares about that? All we need to do is pay attention to this question. It says how much of the substance remains in the sample after 30 years? So that's the number that you need to be using to find the answer, okay? So we're literally just plugging in 30 for t. So I took the same function they have, 350 e negative 0.028, and I'm just plugging in 30 for t. I have that whole thing in my calculator, and it told me to round it to the nearest whole gram, okay? So let's see, 350 e, and then up there is negative 0 0.028 times 30. It looks exactly like it does on the paper, but this zero is not gonna change that one. So it stays 151. This one's nice because you're just plugging it in a calculator. It's not like those right e equation problems. Those are a little bit, <laughs> a little bit harder. Okay, 41, we're gonna skip for now, but we're gonna go over 42. So 42 is a really nice problem too. They do not ask you about the size on the final. All they ask you for on the final is the augmented matrix. So they give you the system of equations and then you just need to write the augmented matrix. And so we're actually gonna have practice with two different problems on writing the, the augmented matrix. All the augmented matrices is just the coefficients of the x, the coefficients of the y, and then the constants. So notice you have negative seven and four, so they're there in the same order. Positive two and negative three, they're there in the same order. And then six and six, which are also there in the same order, okay? This is the answer and that's all they want, okay? So it's nice. This problem in the real though asked you for the size. So remember, size comes from the number of rows by the number of columns. And notice that I have two rows, but I have one, two, three columns, okay? So that's how we get the size. It's always the rows by the columns. Now, 43, um, 43 says, use the gauss jordan method to solve the system of equations. And so 
what we needed to do, and there's a lot to un unfold here. So let me get my little notebook. So I did put in an augmented matrix, but notice that this is not ready to be put in the augmented matrix because your constants are on the wrong side. So I had to minus the 41 over and I had to add the 17 over so that eventually the top equation became negative 25x minus 3y equal to negative 41. And the bottom equation became 10x plus y equal to positive 7. Then I could put the negative 25 in the 10, the negative 3 and the invisible positive 1, and then the negative 41 and the 17. Now we have to remember the process of solving using Gauss Jordan. The first thing you do is you change this to a one. Then the second thing you do is you change this to a zero. Then the third thing you do is change this side to a one. And then the last thing that you'll do is change this spot to zero. And whatever happens consequently over here, we'll, these numbers will, will just be what they are, okay? But when you're done, if you change that to a one and that to a zero and this to a zero and this to a one, Remember what these represent. This represents one X and no Y's. So that means X would equal whatever this number is, okay? And then here you have no X's, but one Y equal to whatever that number is, okay? So let me write the arrow over here too. So that's the goal, okay? You wanna get that one zero zero one so that you can know what X is and you could know what Y is. FYI, remember I told you guys, I am not, I am not looking at your work unless you got something marked wrong. It's multiple choice. There's gonna be a bunch of answers given. And the question is, is do I have to do Gauss Jordan and the method? Not really. You could plug the X and Y value of the burden they give you and see if this computation equals zero. Then plug in the X and the Y value, see if this computation equals zero. The point that makes this true for both equations is the answer, okay? And so even though I did all this work and I found that that was the answer, this point would be one of the options, right, in the, um, in the test. You could just plug in two for X, plug in negative three for Y, and see if it works in both of your equations, okay? And if there's a whole bunch of answers, just try them all and see which one works. That's the solution, okay? However, the there's two problems on the test, on the test, and neither one of them make you do the Gauss start and elimination. However, I used this problem to address the two questions you are going to get on the final, okay? So, this says, this is the, the, what I have, and this is very similar to what you'll have on the, um, the final. You'll have a one, a zero, and then a bunch of numbers, okay? And it'll ask you the question, what is the next step that should be performed? You have to remember the order in which you're supposed to change things, and you have to remember how to change things, okay? So remember the order. It was to change this to a one first, then this to a zero second, then it was to change this to a one third, okay? Before you ever get to that number. And how do we change things to one? In order to change things to a one, what you do is you divide by that number, right? Isn't this number divided by its any number divided by itself, right? Is one. So all you have to do is divide the whole row by that exact number and you'll get it to turn to a one. So this is what I wrote here because I don't know how the answers are gonna look in the choices, okay? So it says, 
um, R2, because this is row two that I'm trying to change, I did R2 divided by negative one fifth, which remember when you divide fractions, it's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So notice I flipped over the negative one fifth. And what is five divided by negative one? Isn't that just negative five? So it's actually the same as just taking negative five times R2. And I'm pretty sure that your choices are more like this one then they will like those. Okay. Now here's another example. So if you have the problem like this, where this is a one, this is a zero, that's already a one, but this is not a zero yet. If it asks you what's the next step you should be performed, it is to get this to turn to a zero. Okay. How do you do that? You take the opposite sign of this which is negative 325 over two, I'm sorry, negative three over 25. You multiply it by the other row. This is in row one. So I'm gonna multiply it by row two. And then I'm gonna add this number, which is in row one. So then you add row one, okay? So I would do negative three over 25 times row two, which will give me a negative three over 25. And when I add a positive three over 25, it gives me that zero that we want. Now, the last thing that I have seen people ask the question on the test is what is the solution? So if you did all that work and you got it down to this, then it's very easy, right? X equals two. Um, no X's, but Y equals negative three. So then that's the answer, okay? However, what is the solution if they give you the problem like this, okay? So if they give you the matrix like this, um, how do you find out what the solution is, okay? So I just wanted to kind of give you an example because I saw one like this on the final. So remember that's one X, so there's my one X. It's a positive, so it's plus. If this was a negative, it'd be minus. Two fifths Y and then equals negative one. And this equation has no X's, but a positive one fifth Y equal to 10. All I gotta do is solve this baby equation. And how do I do that? I multiply both sides by five. So I get that one Y equals 50 now. And then I can plug that 50 into this equation to hopefully figure out what X is. So I plugged in the 50 for Y. I typed this in my calculator and it told me it was 20 and then I minus 20 on both sides and I got that the wrong answer, obviously. I got, I should have got X equals negative 21. So then this would be negative 21 comma 50. Okay. And I will post this one with a new file because I scribbled all over it. I also saw another problem, okay, in the final that was not on this review at all. So I skipped number 44, but I did take a problem from New York, 5.2 section, number 10. And so I wrote down what the problem said, and I just kind of wanted to go over like how you set it up, because once you set it up correctly, then you can just check all the answers that are in the choices, right? Plug in the X where the X's are, plug in the Y where the Y's are, and see if you get those particular numbers, okay? Um, but the hard part is gonna be setting it up, okay? So this one says, if a building contractor hires six day laborers, one concrete finisher, his payroll for the day is this dollar amount. If he hires one day laborer and five concrete finishers, his daily cost is this amount. So find the daily wage for each type of worker. So there's two types of worker, the day laborers and the concrete finishers. So I just picked random X and Y. I let X equal the daily wage for the day laborer. And then I let Y equal the daily wage for the concrete finisher. So when you told me you had six late day laborers in the first sentence, I wrote six times however much each one of those people get paid, right? Plus one concrete finisher. So one guy is gonna get paid the daily wage for the concrete finisher. 
Um, and then that was supposed to total out to 1016. Then the next sentence tells me that he has one day laborer, but five concrete finishers. So one times the wage for the day laborer plus five times the wage for the concrete finisher. And that total cost was 1136. Once you have this, you don't have to solve the matrix. Like I did it by solving the matrix to get two answers. But what you would do just to save yourself some time and headaches <laughs> is you would go through all of those choices and then just make sure you're checking them into the equation that you set up, okay? So if you can set up the equation, then you should be golden on this problem. <laughs>